First of all, I want to welcome all of you here tonight and thank you for coming and also to our Zoom uh, group. Welcome to the cloud, welcome from the cloud uh, and to the cloud. Um, <clears throat> it's my very great pleasure to welcome all of you tonight and also it's my honor to introduce you to Dr. Lovely, Dr. Mary E. Lovely. As impressive as it is, I won't read Dr. Lovely's, Lovely's entire resume. There isn't enough time for that. But the following highlights should give you enough of her credentials to convince you that we are all in for a rare treat of scholarship, insight, and wisdom from one of our country's great teachers at the Peterson Institute. She served as the 2022 Carnegie Chair in US-China Relations with the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. She is Professor Emeritus of Economics at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, where she was Melvin A. Eggers Economics Faculty Scholar from 2010 to 2022. She was co-editor of the China Economic Review during 2011 through 2015 and is the author of numerous scholarly, pub scholarly publications, too numerous to mention. She earned her PhD in economics at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and a master's degree in city and regional planning from Harvard University. Dr. Lovely is a much sought after commentator on US trade relations and an award-winning teacher. Won't you please welcome her to the dais? Thank you, Charles, for that wonderful in uh, introduction. And thanks to the Foreign Policy Association for inviting me. It's truly an honor to be with you tonight. I always receive these invitations, and I'm never able to come. So it's nice that I'm able to attend one of them. And just, I guess I have to sing for my supper tonight. Um, what we're going to talk about tonight is very topical. It's on the top of a lot of people's minds in Washington, DC, where from whence I come. Um, and um, I hope we'll have a little bit of time for questions. So I'll try not to spend too much time on things. You can yell out if you think I'm going too fast over some things. Um, let me just see here. Yeah, one of the things I want to say is that I have the privilege of being a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C., which is a nonpartisan think tank that specializes in uh, macroeconomics, international finance, and international economics. We have some also focus on particular regions, and I also cover China for Peterson, as well as trade um, and investment. Um, Pete Peterson, for whom today's um, lecture uh, is named, was one of the co-founders of the Peterson Institute. So this really is a treat for me to be here tonight. Um, one of the things that I hear a lot being in Washington um, from the so-called policy elites, so I spent 30 years in Syracuse, so I still kind of think of myself as, I do think of myself as one of the ordinary people. Syracuse is a place without heirs, uh, and I think it's a good grounding to have when you think about foreign policy. Um, we hear all the time in Washington that we are entering into a new era of US-China relations, and I think there's really little doubt that that is in fact true. The new era is marked by the elevation of national security above economic security, so a uh, open willingness to sacrifice efficiency uh, and uh, GDP gains for um, some increase in um, national security, particularly a reduction in our integration with China. Um, it's also characterized by a focus on the domestic economy. And President Biden and his national security advisor, Jake, Bi uh, Jake Sullivan, who gave a major international economic speech last April, uh, listed the domestic economy as the foundation for their international economic policy. And I think you'll see tonight that's true. And lastly, I think it's the new era comes from a great skepticism about the value of our relationship with China. Um, this is really a sea change um, that has occurred, I would say, um, since probably before the election of President Donald Trump. President Biden's international economic pro uh, priorities reflect this new thinking. And it's really summed up, I think, in the words resilience and security. There's a, a big push for economic resilience, for resilient supply chains, secure supply chains. 
uh, diversification. And I want to try to take you through some of how the administration is putting this into practice tonight so that you can understand where we're heading um, with economic interna international economic policy and how these new priorities are shaping how the U.S. engages um, with the rest of the world. Um, I also want to focus on what constraints the U.S. faces in trying to reshape global supply chains because there are <laughs> many other countries besides the United States in the world, not least of which is China. And the United States pulling away from China doesn't mean that China is going away or disappearing. In fact, we're gonna see China's role in the global economy is actually increasing. So let me turn now to my first slide. <laughs> okay, this is a funny lectern, it doesn't have a screen. Um, so the foundations of the new old relationship have crumbled. We used to think about the relationship with China as win-win. That's a favorite term of President Xi Jinping of China. Um, but I think in the United States, we largely believed it was a win-win too. Um, producing, offshoring some of our more labor-intensive activities to China, buying uh, things that were not offshored but had moved to China or were developed in China was a win for U.S. consumers and U.S. businesses, many of which purchased uh, lower-priced intermediate goods and helped to keep U.S. companies competitive in global markets. Um, the win-win economics wasn't a hard sell 15 years ago. Today, we question whether it's still beneficial to the United States to be so deeply engaged with China. Some of the criticisms that you hear most often are unfair trade, uh, particularly from subsidization of their industries. Uh, clearly, the, a concern about theft of U.S. intellectual property or technology transfer, unforced technology transfer. And then, of course, growing distrust in China's military ambitions, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, but also more, more uh, globally. Now, there were efforts under President Trump to reframe um, this, the commercial relationship in particular with China. Um, I, I think you all remember the U.S.-China trade war, uh, which began in 2018, um, and has to this day uh, placed tariffs of up to 25% on almost 60% of all the goods that we buy from China. So we have taxed very heavily the imports that we get from China. Um, what we see in the data is, of course, that that has reduced the um, U.S. purchases of goods that are taxed. Uh, however, the total value of our imports from China continues to rise. So it is, in some sense, less than we would have bought otherwise, but we're still on an upward trend overall. Um, but despite President Trump's efforts, and in particular what culminated in so-called phase one agreement, which was a real focus on basically forcing the Chinese to buy U.S. exports. Um, there was no new normal that was established. Um, of course, President Trump uh, lost the next election. We have President Biden. And candidate Biden was very cogent in his criticism of the Trump tariffs. In particular, um, he was very pointed in saying that these tariffs were passed forward to U.S. businesses and consumers. The academic evidence or scientific evidence that supported that statement is really undeniable. We have multiple studies on both the Chinese side and the American side that the tariffs were passed through to the United States and Chinese tariffs on U.S. goods, particularly U.S. agricultural goods, were passed through to Chinese consumers. So. Um, each side basically reduced its own effective GDP, real GDP, but not by much, less than one half of 1% of GDP. So they took a big shot, they get a, did a little damage, um, but we're still hanging. We still have those tariffs. We haven't seen a resolution to the key issues that underlay the original complaints, which is namely concern about theft of US technology and intellectual property. Okay. Panda diplomacy is no longer effective. I have to talk about the pandas. As you know, uh, the U.S. was given a panda when President Nixon made his historic visit to Beijing and began the normalization of relations between U.S. and China. Uh, over time, China began to lend more pandas globally, but especially to the United States, 
And this was to the benefit of both countries. People love going to see the pandas. Of course, I live in Washington now, so the National Zoo has been overwhelmed with people who are trying to see the pandas before December, which I'll come back to. Um, and the Chinese, uh, of course, didn't do this out, just out of the goodness of their hearts. They uh, received hefty fees for the loan of the pandas. That went into conservation, which has been very successful. Um, in, in helping to remove the pandas from the endangered species list. So what went wrong? Well, panda diplomacy has turned into a wolf warrior on the Chinese side. And on the US side, it's become a very aggressive campaign to prevent Chinese access to the most advanced semiconductors. I'm sure you've been hearing about this, the so-called October 7 export controls on Chinese access, not only to the purchase of the semiconductors themselves, but to the materials and machinery that are used to produce those. So the idea is not just to prevent them buying them, it's to really retard their ability to develop their own in-house uh, fabrication of these advanced chips. The US has tried to be very clear that this is taken for national security purposes as opposed to commercial competition. Um, and I think the US has strived to create a, what they call small yard, high fence. Just last week we had clarification of the export controls. And in fact, the, the walls were made higher. The US closed numerous loopholes by which China was able to still access the technology. Um, but also even a little bit of narrowing of the yard. So in that sense, I think the US has tried to uh, stay true to what it says it's its intention with these export controls. For the Chinese, where economic security is national security, this is seen as a very aggressive move, um, an offensive move by the United States. Um, and we can go into later why, but let's just say that access to advanced technology is key to their continuing commitment to their citizens and therefore political stability to continue to grow their economy in a context in which productivity growth is low, Labor force has stopped growing, in fact, it's shrinking. Um, and they have many, many major problems to deal with, including, of course, like we all do, the transition to a green economy. Okay. Um, now, how do we reduce economic independence with China? You might say, well, the Biden administration and Congress more broadly would like to reduce our economic integration with China. We see this as important both for diversification of our export supply. Why? Pick on China if you just want to diversify. If you want to buy from three stores, why is it that you don't want to go to particularly to one? Well, one reason is that China has a disproportionate weight in certain markets. So there are certain goods where our imports from China come, frankly, 100% from China. There are others which are 80, 70, but still there's a heavy reliance on China in certain goods. Um, and the US sees that as potentially a source uh, where it's vulnerable to economic coercion, something that China has certainly practiced with respect to other countries, including South Korea, Lithuania, Australia. So the threat as seen by the US is real. Um, we wanna increase, so one, way we can do this is to increase self-sufficiency. Okay, you can't get it from China, you can make it at home. And that leads to a number of strategies, including increasing stockpiling. Stockpiling's not a you know, panacea, because frankly, stocks deteriorate. They become outdated quickly, and with interest rates going up, it's more expensive for companies to hold these stockpiles. That's only a partial solution. Maybe good for some goods, but not for everything. And clearly not for very large shocks. The other is reshoring. And reshoring serves other priorities of the, this administration, including what it sees as a necessary manufacturing renewal in the United States, and other goals, including um, growing incomes for the middle class. So those are meet what the administration sees as other important domestic priorities, reshoring. A second approach would be to build new supplier networks. So you don't wanna to go to the same store, well, hopefully some new stores will enter the market. One of the problems here is that China is so large that finding companies who strive to find new sources repeatedly tell us this is difficult. Other places just aren't, haven't set up shop to do the things that China has become expert at in 30 years of working with American companies and serving as subcontractors to uh, global multinationals. So 
It is a strategy, it's one we're pursuing, diversification. But again, it does have this difficulty, which is developing new suppliers. The third would be just to reduce reliance on unfriendly sources, what's called de-risking, decoupling, all the D words, I say. Now, what de-risking is, is of course a form of diversification, but it's a discriminatory diversification. It says, I just don't, I don't want to have a, a large variety of sources of supply. I want to not include a particular country in that, that um, menu of suppliers. Now, um, all of these, reshoring, diversification, de-risking, all of them really, if we're honest, are some form of partial decoupling with China. And the goal is to reduce our reliance and our economic integration with China. Here's a little table I've made to try to um, show you how this administration is pursuing these um, alternative strategies. Okay, so some of the policy initiatives here. On reshoring, I think we all know about the CHIPS Act, uh, which is a, uh, an act that subsidizes the manufacture of semiconductors here in the United States. Um, and there's one on the table for my hometown of Syracuse, New York. A micron plan is planned for our, actually East Syracuse, North Syracuse. Um, then the inflation, ill-named Inflation Reduction Act, which is basically uh, an act to um, jet start the new energy transition in the United States. There's lots of subsidies there for EVs. Um, and for the manufacture of all kinds of new energy and the creation of new supplies of critical minerals. The policy tools that are used there are subsidies, tax incentives. This is U.S. returning to industrial policy, something that our allies and friends have not failed to notice. The effectiveness here, I'm going to say it's high, and I'll show you a slide of the number of new plants that have been announced for development in the United States. The, the uh, CHIPS Act comes with very generous subsidies, um, and it's also backed by a belief that to have access to the U.S. market, companies are going to have to manufacture here. So there's not just money on the table, whether it's a direct subsidy or tax credit. It's also the belief that in the future, um, there will be some types of barriers or requirements for manufacturing in the U.S. That's really important because when we think about the U.S., beginning to manufacture things, which frankly can be done at lower cost in Taiwan, you have to ask who are going to be those customers. You know, if you talk to people from Walmart, they will tell you people want to buy American, but if I put something that's a dollar less next to something that's made in America, people will buy the thing for a dollar less. Not, not questioning people's motives, but let's face it, this is a competitive market. The United States is the most competitive mar open market in the world. And if it's uh, very effective in bringing companies here, it also has problems with very high costs. It's a high cost to the taxpayers, and it's why we're not going to likely see reshoring, uh, being able to be um, expanded to other sectors, barring any large shock to the global economy, which we can't rule out anymore uh, after uh, the last few years. The second strategy is, of course, de-risking. And here I put the Trump era trade tariffs. People often ask, why did, profess uh, why did uh, President Biden, who criticized the Trump tariffs so, so strongly during the election, why does he keep them? I mean, I've asked that a million times because those tariffs, to me, make no sense. They're completely scattershot. They include things like different kinds of children's boots, um, but they completely exempt Apple products. We may know why that is. We all love them, right? We wouldn't want a 25% tax on them. So. Um, but they clearly are not strategically designed to protect us from uh, technology items or other types of critical dependencies. You might think they'd be related to the share of imports that we get from China or other measures of dependence, uh, therefore trying to reduce our dependence and letting new suppliers into the U.S. market. But that's not how they were designed. President, that wasn't the end point in President Trump's uh, mine, I think it was, to go for the phase one agreement, grow, go to have the Chinese buy more exports from the U.S. Now, it's differential tariffs, and I have to say these are discriminatory tariffs. They violate the world, our obligations under the World Trade Organization. We may not like that, but that's true, because the foundation of the World Trade Organization is non-discrimination. So these tariffs are 
um, a source of conflict between us and EU and other countries who believe in the WTO or rules-based trade system. Um, so they are differential tariffs. We are also using export controls as a way of de-risking. Um, and I've talked about that a little bit earlier. It, it's a little different. It's that not that we want, don't want to buy, it's that we don't want to sell. So it's, but it's really a form of de-risking the relationship. How effective are these um, uh, types of policies? I would say that they're moderately effective in the sense that the Trump tariffs did have the effect of reducing our imports from the level that they would have been in the absence of those tariffs. So it's a strong price mechanism that works to change where multinationals, and multinationals really mediate about half of the bundle that the US buys from China. It mediates the strategies that they use in terms of serving the American market. Um, and how costly are they? I say moderately costly, partly because the cost is spread out among so many people. Each of us pay more now for things that we buy from China if they are subject to tariff, but it's a small amount. Some people have estimated it's about one percentage point in the inflation rate uh, when those tariffs went on. So, you know, it's moderately successful, moderately costly. The cost is spread among a lot of people and therefore it doesn't, you know, raise anyone's ire too much. The last strategy is friendshoring, sometimes called nearshoring, if it involves Mexico and the United States or Eastern Europe for the European Union. Thank you. Um, the, Real poster child for this is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, IPEF, as we like to say in passing on Washington streets, so many acronyms. IPEF is interesting because it's an attempt by the Biden administration to create a new, an alternative network, um, one based on what the Biden administration sees as high standards that the American people want to see in a trading relationship. So high labor standards, uh, you know, no forced labor, no child labor, uh, right to collective bargaining, uh, high environmental standards, um, but the Biden administration has been unwilling to really make any concessions uh, in terms of market access, so there will be no reductions in tariffs. This framework will not have to go before Congress, it might be a little tough these days, uh, getting a new bill through Congress, especially one related to trade, and so it's not designed not to have that, but that also means that it really doesn't have a lot of things that the US is committing to. It's really committing to talking about things. The first product of this effort has been the supply chain agreement. And that is basically an agreement to try to discuss and get information on supply chains, identify vulnerabilities, and begin to discuss the possibility of coordinated action um, in the case of supply shocks. Those are very important things for us to do, um, but the language is very weak. It's the government intends to, it will do. So the, the region itself is wary of US involvement uh, on this, at, in this type of involvement, not because they don't want, it, they don't want the US uh, building a deeper economic relationship with Asia. They absolutely 100% welcome that, want that, uh, it would be a compliment, as they see it, to our security presence in the region. But um, they're wary of U.S. imposing high standards on them that basically make it impossible for them to compete on the, on the fact that they are labor-abundant countries with low wages, low productivity. Um, and they're wary of U.S. implicit demands to reduce the role of China in their supply chains. And I'll come, come back to that, too, very shortly. Okay. Thanks, Matt. This is shows new announced plants since January, uh, since May 2020, semiconductors, equipment manufacturers, materials. Would all of this, is all of this the result of the CHIPS Act? We can't really say. Some of those projects might have gone into place anyway, um, but activity has improved or increased dramatically since the CHIPS Act was originally announced. What about, um, friend shoring and near shoring. Um, as I mentioned, the IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Framework, is the best example right now. Um, another is restrictions contained in the Inflation Reduction Act. In the IRA, to be eligible for the full $7,500 uh, subsidy for your next EV, 
the critical minerals in the batteries will have to come from a selected set of countries. Um, Congress limited those to countries with which we had an FTA. Uh, we don't have an FTA with Europe, that's a problem. Uh, we had an FTA with South Korea, but not with Japan. So we've had to go back and create some agreements so that our close allies can participate. Um, we don't have enough critical minerals in this country right now to, build, to satisfy the demand for EVs, at least as forecast by the uh, Department of Transportation and other agencies. So we are going to have to rely on friends. Um, another reason why we need to rely on nearshoring is that, as I mentioned before, it's costly to reshore, but it's also impossible. The U.S. is close to full employment. Um, we simply cannot produce very labor-intensive goods at anything close to a competitive price. Uh, I don't know about you, but I really don't want the price of my toaster being, you know, driven up by the fact that um, it's going to. I'm going to have to pay $25 an hour to have that toaster put together. We're going to have to replace China with other uh, middle-income countries. I don't say low-income countries because really they're not part of the game. Middle-income countries. So friendshoring is an essential part of this uh, move to reduce reliance on China. You can't just say, I don't want to buy from China. You have to say, where are you going to satisfy the demands of businesses and consumers and households in the U.S. for the things that they buy? Now, here is a picture. Looks a little scary, but it's not. This is the 2010 global export share of a bunch of low middle income countries. These are countries which, by their profiles, might make a good alternative site for production that's now done in China. There's certainly ones where major multinationals would be looking to see if this is someplace where they should invest. On this axis is the 2019 global export share, and any country above this axis is actually increasing the share of global manufactured goods that it delivers to the market. So these are sort of the success stories. Notice one thing first. These are low shares, 2.5%, 3%. They're nowhere close to China's 15 to 17%. So again, I, as I said before, it's going to be hard to replace all that capacity. We can make marginal changes, as we are, we see that one of the dominant countries here is Mexico, and of course that's because of its proximity to the United States and the US MCA, um, so the US-Mexico-Canada agreement. So Mexico has for a long time been uh, integrating into the US uh, production networks, um, particularly in certain sectors such as autos and auto parts, and so it has a high share of global trade because it trades with the United States. Another country that has come along is India, um, India is a large country, certainly one that could potentially on paper be promising, um, but which has always disappointed. It has been um, repeatedly liberalizing protectionist, liberalizing protectionist. It has a number of uh, stringent regulations which make it under, not that attractive to global investors. That may be changing. We're seeing a lot of multinationals, including India, going in to, to India right now, um, and we may see that increasing. The Indian government, unfortunately, is moving more protection in a more protectionist way, and we'll see where those two trends go. Turkey, particularly for um, Europe, Vietnam, huge winner. Um, part of this increase in Vietnam's global share here, almost 2% for a relatively small country, is because of the um, production that went there following the 2018-2019 U.S. tariffs on China. Now, some of that was global multinationals, like um, the subcontractors that serve Adidas or Nike. Vietnam is now the uh, site of all of Samsung's handset production. Um, but it again, has limitations um, in terms of its size and its capability and the rate at which it can raise its productivity fast enough to replace some of the higher value added things that have been done previously in China. It also has one other problem, which is that, at least from a US perspective, and here I am thinking of the US perspective, which is that a lot of these new plants are opened up with Chinese investment. So, um, and, of course, the Vietnamese trade deficit, trade surplus with the United States has skyrocketed as all that uh, processing uh, activity has gone into the country. Okay, now, how much diversification is possible for the U.S. through this mechanism of friendshoring? I have tried to convince you that friendshoring has got to be part of the strategy. It's an important part of the strategy. 
but it's got a major problem. And part of that problem is that for most of the countries um, that we think would be suitable alternative sites, China is their number one trading partner. So in some sense, we may not be making our supply chains um, less integrated with China. We may simply be making them longer, more complex, less transparent, but still dependent on China. And we could say, well, what share? Because one of the arguments has been, well, if you move final assembly from China, say to Malaysia or Vietnam, you're actually reducing the value added that we buy from China. Simple mathematics. I have to agree with that. You don't need to be an economics professor to do that math. However, we all know, too, that you only need one crucial input to really hold up global supply chains. We saw this um, with the semiconductors that were missing um, that had been diverted to the tremendous surge in demand for electronics for home offices following the move of all of us uh, to work from home. Um, and the automakers saying, oh, we're not gonna need those chips, nobody's gonna, and then of course they needed the chips, people were buying cars, and we had empty lots, lost profits, uh, very high prices for consumers, so people didn't like that. Why? They were missing some chips, and some of those chips were as simple as the chip that puts your window up and down in your car, right? Not a, you might think, not a crucial chip, but if you bought a new car and your window doesn't go down, you might think that is a crucial chip. So my point here is that China will still control very important parts of these supply chains. Here, this graph that we've just created, the Peterson Institute, shows the change in these, the China share of imports and exports. Imports in blue, exports in red, for all of the countries that are participating in the Indo-Pacific economic framework. So this is the set of countries that the US has identified as those in which we want to create this alternative network. And what you can see if you look at the blue or imports is that the China share is rising in almost every single country. In fact, when we look at diversification, there are some countries that have diversified. The US has diversified, um, and that is really traced back to 2017. So from 2017 onward with those high tariffs. Also Japan, Japan has reduced its reliance on China, but mainly in labor intensive goods like shoes, apparel, um, not goods that we might think of as critically important in the case of a national security emergency. Um, South Korea has deliberately, and perhaps most successfully diversified, coming from its experience with economic coercion from China, particularly in a, in a product called urea, which it needs to maintain its vehicles. Um, and so politicians in South Korea were faced with a very real threat of not being able, of bringing all transport in South Korea to a halt. They take this stuff very seriously. So South Korea, Japan, the United States, who's not diversifying? The EU. EU China's share for the EU is higher than um, it, ha it was 10 years ago. So China is here. It's still important. And we have to decide what are the most important risks how do we you know, identify those risks and work with our partners to provide a system whereby we can withstand shocks to those systems by joining together? Now, de-risking, is it happening? I've already talked about how it's happening in Japan, South Korea, and the US, but not the EU, despite the EU's intent and best efforts. More importantly, perhaps, just developing countries are not de-risking. We know that the global south is not moving along with us, it's moving away from us. We can see this in votes at the UN and in a whole variety of other measures. Um, and they're certainly not reducing their reliance on China, despite the fact that many of them are wary of China um, and um, see the problems that sometimes are, are caused, yet China still main, often makes them the best offer. Most of them are desperately in need of investment for climate modification, um, infrastructure investment, other types of investment to, to grow. Um, so China remains attractive to them, and right now, frankly, we are really not offering very much. We are focused on our, our our homeland, we're focused on this small set of countries with which we might find alternative sites of production, um, and China continues to make inroads into the global south. Um, the last part here is about China moving into alternative global value chains production sites. China, as I said, is just not going away. We can't put our hands over our eyes and pretend it doesn't exist or turn our back. We have to deal with it. 
And one of the things we have to deal with is that China investment is increasing. Perhaps some of you read a couple weeks ago um, the article about the uh, multi-billion dollar investment the Chinese have made in Mexico, right over the border from Texas. I know we have some folks from Texas with us tonight. Uh, and this will be a three-phase development. The first phase will be um, production, so processing, as we have done for years in Mexico, starting with the maquiladoras, but then moving through the UMCA to other parts of the country. The second part will be logistics, so wholesale and retail trade, and the third part will be business services. So a gigantic uh, development um, in Mexico. What do we think of that? How do we respond to that? These are really important questions. Again, we can't make it, wish it away. We can't rule it away because the rest of the world is large. We depend on them. We need them um, for these supplies. Um, and we have to have a strategy. And I think that strategy really has to be one based on targeting. We have to say, where are the most important things for us to do? All of this is going to be enormously costly for US multinationals, for US consumers, for the US government, and that, hence the taxpayers. And so we have to try to decide what are the risks and which, which are the risks that we're able to tackle. One last thing on this is a picture that you might have seen in Martin Wolf's column earlier this week in the Financial Times, reminding the world that China's the global, global share, share of global exports has risen. It has certainly tapered off since 2020. Um, it's picked up again. There it is up there in the blue. I wouldn't want to draw too much of that because you know China had a double whammy first in 2020 and then again in 2022 with COVID when its factories, um, many of its factories were closed. Um, so we're really not seeing any decline in China's role in the global economy. Okay, so our decoupling ambitions have to be tempered by an understanding of global constraints. We haven't, you know, um, outlawed the rules of economics. And we are one country, an important country, a large country, inside a global economy. What kind of constraints are most important? The first one is one I've already mentioned. China's not going away. We have to deal with it. We have to deal with it being in global supply chains. Because even if the US reduces direct reliance, we fool ourselves into thinking that we're still not vulnerable. Therefore, we have to say, if we don't get, you know, a new pair of tennis shoes, maybe that's not the end of the world. If we don't get PPP, maybe that is really important. So we have to make those decisions, and I, and I know that work is being done now in Washington, but we were caught back-footed. We have a lot of work to do in terms of creating those lists and finding a strategy to ensure that American public has the supplies they need when they need it. The last is that the U.S. so far has been unwilling to offer friends some quid pro quo for um, helping the US economy to be more resilient. So by this, I really tried to fit this all in one, <laughs> one sentence. It may seem a bit terse, it is. You know, we are focused, rightly so, I think, on renewing the American economy, on making sure that our economy has high productivity, that it's inclusive, that is everybody who wants to work can, can work, that's important. Um, in a market, a market economy like ours, it's in sense sacred. It's part of our, uh, you know, the government, our relationship with each other, that people who want to find productive work can. That's important, that people are able to earn a living wage. Those things are all important. But it's also important to recognize that the U.S. is the global leader. We have been the global leader. And we can't just back away from our commitments. In some sense, we are backing away from our commitments now. We are backing away from renewal in the World Trade Organization. Okay, we may say, we don't like it. We don't like that China's in it. We don't like that it constrains our ability to do some things. Well, then build something else. Find a new, find a new solution. Just this week, we pulled out of global talks on digital trade. Does that mean that digital trade negotiations and digital trade isn't going to continue in the globe? Of course it is. It will be developed by the Chinese. It will be developed in Asia and we won't have a say. So I think this is a failing, it's a, it's a real um, temptation because of the importance of rebuilding the homeland. But it's one that we, I think, will fall into at our peril. We need to offer more to our friends. Now, what do I mean by that? The global south wants to be part of America's supply chains. So, you know, the move away from China 
causes them problems because China's a major supplier as well as a major buyer of their goods. Um, but it also offers opportunities. There's a lot of uh, politicians around the world eyeing that US market and thinking, boy, I would really like to hook into the global value chains that serve the United States. How can I do that? The US needs to offer a hand up. As an Indian uh, friend, former Indian ambassador to the United Nations said to me the other day over lunch, if the US had a green plan for the world, even if it was funded at a very modest level, it would be a big signal that it's thinking about the, the rest of the world and how they can play in the new supply chains that we're trying to create, the new economy that we're trying to create. That's not a signal that we're sounding very well to the rest of the world right now. Lastly, the global trading system um, needs leadership. And we hope that leadership comes from the United States. Um, but if it doesn't, it will come from somewhere. The European Union is trying to provide that leadership. You've seen it in their um, CBAM, or Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. The, the European Union is launching a method by which it will tax any inputs that exceed a certain level of carbon in their production. They said, okay, world, we've got to reduce carbon. We've been waiting for this long enough. We're gonna do it, and we're not gonna let you underprice us by not doing it yourselves, and we're gonna have a, a tax on your goods. Is it a perfect solution? It is not. But it's moving, and it's trying to lead. Where is the US? We're trying to do a green steel, gasa, but we haven't gotten very far. So I think that as we look ahead, we see that we are, have a lot of ambitions. They're important ambitions. Renewing the domestic economy, making sure that we have greater economic resilience, that we improve our ability to um, withstand global shocks, that we become less vulnerable and dependent on, a, on China. Um, we have become too dependent. We obviously need the, some of this diversification no matter what happens in the future. All of these are important goals. In the meantime, we have to keep our eye on US global leadership. It's important for us. They're important markets. The United States remains the second largest manufactured good exporter in the world. One of the largest uh, exporters of business services that creates a lot of jobs in the United States. We are the technology leader in almost every segment, whether it's by end market or sub product, and we want to continue to be. So as we look at home, we need to keep an eye on the global economy Think about what our policymakers are doing and hope for the wisdom to see that the world is big and it will withstand this, we hope, um, and that through cooperation and peace, maybe we can get to a safer, more secure, more resilient global economy. Thank you. Uh, now as we turn to Q&A, uh, if you don't mind just pointing them out, I will bring the microphone around. Please wait for it and then... Is the United States placing too much emphasis on political solutions rather than um, economic solutions? Um, as an example, as we go into green tech, um, there's growing importance on access to a lot of uh, materials. Uh, and I would give, an, as an example, rare earths. We've been talking about uh, our reliance on China for rare earths for ever, and nothing has been done. Um, are we? Are we not doing enough on the economic front to uh, ensure competitiveness? I think we are definitely trying to move forward on critical minerals um, like rare earths, but it's a very difficult problem, partly because of the imp important role that China plays. So again, China pops its head up in, in trying to resolve these issues. Let me take the case of Indonesia. Indonesia is a male n major nickel producer, um, and it has, um, welcomed foreign investment from China. China's co Chinese companies do most of the uh, refining and processing of nickel within, in, within Indonesia. Um, the US so far has refused to sign a free trade agreement with Indonesia to allow Indonesian critical minerals to be used in our EV supply chain. Because you have to realize that if, you're, if your critical minerals are not eligible for the $7,500 subsidy, you're not playing in this game, right? Uh, if I'm going to the market to look for an EV, I'm going to find one that gets me a subsidy. Um, so they desperately want in. 
um, but they have this problem. They also have an export ban on nickel, which the U.S. opposes, um, and that is deliberately there to force the refining and processing within the country. So the idea is we don't want you to just come, take the stuff out of the ground and leave. We want you to create jobs for our citizens. So here's, I think, a case where we do have to compromise. This is my own personal view, that we have to recognize the natural aspirations of these countries to be more than. And the Biden administration has says that it is, but we haven't seen any movement here yet. More deeply, we're gonna to have to face issues involving trade-offs of producing some of this stuff in our own country, because of course we do have some um, critical minerals here in the United States, as well as in Canada, um, and in parts of Northern Europe. And one of the reasons why we don't have a big supply right now is because much of this is very dirty, um, environmentally intensive, um, not exactly the most um, desirable jobs. And so how are we gonna bring that jobs here in a way that is clean and sensitive to the land issues that exist in the Western US or Northern Canada. So it's really a very hard problem, but we have begun to try to tackle them. But again, we come up with this uh, having to say, I want everything, and, but have to make compromises if we're gonna move forward. Yeah, this man here. I think he's coming with the mic. Yep. Uh, I, I was just curious about your uh, presentation on the tariffs because my understanding is that in fact the trade deficit went from a 450 billion f a highly rising one down to back down to 200 billion which to my mind is the highest sustainable so I'm was curious at your take because I think it's just factually we have decoupled substantially um, and it has come by going to these other uh, uh, places, but it's come down very, very sharply is my understanding. Our total purchases from China are up. They, this, since 2020, the series is very noisy because of what was going on, because of the asynchronous movements of the pandemic through the global economy. So my sense, my sense would be don't look at the deficit, look at what's happened to the share, trade share, and clearly that has been coming down. So in that sense, I agree with you. I think we have been decoupling, which is why I put the Trump tariffs under the uh, de-risking category and why I think they have proven useful for the Biden administration um, and why, despite the fact that they're not well-designed, they are useful. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Lovely. I wanted to follow up on that theme under um, the export controls and de-risking. Can you please um, share your thoughts on what I think most of us read was a couple of weeks ago, the Chinese announced, well, one of their companies, um, 5G technology for a, a phone that surprised. Oh, yeah, you know, Huawei given, phone. Right, yes, yeah, yeah. given the um, controls that we were implementing on high technology, China was still able to, uh, a Chinese company was still able to develop this high technology. So th the question is about your view in terms of really the effectiveness of these controls. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a great question, thank you. Um, there's no doubt that there was a lot of stockpiling and that there were equipment in China that allowed them to produce a phone with a seven nanometer chip um, and other technologies. The US, um, that is not so focused on those, and they're focused on more advanced chips, particularly the chips that are from NVIDIA, the, the GPUs, uh, graphic processing units. I mean, I remember years ago, my son wanted a computer, and I thought I was really cool because I learned about NVIDIA chips and went to Best Buy and said, my son likes to game, and I know it's for his freshman year at college, but I'd really like one with a NVIDIA chip, and the, Best Buy guy was quite impressed that uh, you know this middle-aged lady was able to mention what kind of you know GPU I wanted. So these are really special chips, and of course they have become crucial to the development of AI. That wasn't the original intent. Uh, the original market was heavily into gaming um, and graphic displays, but now they're critical for AI. And the, this is really the, the, tar the focus of what the Americans are doing. And the recent, the more recent um, tightening uh, really reflects a very deep uh, investigation of that episode and others uh, that try to close loopholes, add more countries through which you can't route equipment, 
Um, and we've also had buy-in from two key partners, the Japanese uh, and the Netherlands, who have very important irreplaceable um, equipment manufacturers. So we are, as I said, trying to make that small yard high fence have even higher small yard high fence, even higher fences, even higher walls. Um, and by most accounts, um, this tightening um, has happened. The Chinese realize it has set back their ambitions um, for these advanced chips. Um, but there's no doubt that, as any DOD person will tell you, we're buying time. Um, so it's not if, it's when. And we have, I think, done significant um, damage to the old timelines that they had. Um, and they're, they're, that's something that I'm sure is being dealt with at the highest levels in China. Question from the Zoom chat. Uh, thank you for your presentation. <laughs> um, and the question is, why is the EU so uh, tied with China? Has the U.S. ever tried to encourage them to decouple, or is it simply a matter of the EU doing what it wants to do? The EU, of course, is a complex being, right? Because uh, it has the European Union, the Commission, and then it has the member states. But um, the president of the European uh, Commission, OK, uh, Ursula von Leyen, she has clearly stated that she agrees with de-risking, not decoupling, de-risking, and is fully on board. One of the problems is just, as I said, this is a hard ship to turn around. and. Probably we're still de digging into the actual trade statistics, but it seems that one of the reasons is the recent surge in EV exports from China. So it, some of these dependencies are due to just a few sectors. Uh, just to give you a, another kind of uh, statistic that highlights that, if you take all of the goods that we import from China, it's an enormous bundle, but 35% of that is related to electronics, so communications devices, you know, handsets, TVs, that's huge. Um, so a few sectors can really make a big difference. Yes, please. Um, Kathy Murray. Hi, Kathy. Uh, um, my question has to do, and it may not be in your purview, higher education and how those numbers play into the numbers you're using. and in terms of breaking up is hard to do. I see students who, they're gonna get caught in between, they can't go back to China because worrying that, and the, they can't stay here because the US is worried about them sharing secrets. So any thoughts you have on higher education and how it plays into breaking up? Hmm, certainly a question near and dear to my heart because economics departments around the world have certainly benefited from the influx of Chinese students. As you will can, can guess, they haven't gone to all departments in equal proportion. Um, it's a big problem. I was on a panel at the Brookings Institution a couple weeks ago, and we had a man who was a national security advisor specializing in tech who emphasized the need for us to continue to have technology talent coming from China. As all of us know, the Chinese students, postdocs, um, have been very important in terms, also as their, the, as their career progresses into being professors and scientists, has been very important um, in developing science in this country. Uh, when people study uh, the proliferation of Chinese patents, the most important patents, those that have the most citations internationally, are those that are done in collaboration with American scientists, and of that group, the most productive are those that are done on U.S. soil. So this has been a very, very important and productive relationship for both countries. Um, the problem is that keeping this flow, as you note, going, and if the hostility between the two countries continues to rise, is really unrealistic. The students, um, some will stay, and some do stay, but most will not. And um, I think it's unreasonable to think that we'll continue to get the number of students that we get from China um, in, a, in, a, in a hostile uh, atmosphere. So it's a problem. Um, we hope that the recent thawing of relations, to the extent that there is a thawing, we know that President Biden has sent three secretary cabinet, uh, cabinet secretaries to Beijing recently. Secretary Blinken, Secretary Yellen of the Treasury, and Secretary Raimondo. So three real heavy hitters in the administration. And um, that uh, Governor Gavin Newsom of Can California is there this week, uh, hopefully 
working to prepare the way for a President Xi, President Biden meeting in San Francisco when the in APEC meets in November. So there is a definite emphasis on turning down the heat and trying to make clear what the priorities of the United States are, national security, not you know commercial advantage or trying to destroy the Chinese economy. This is something that President Biden himself has said quite clearly. I think the problem there is that for the Chinese, economic security is national security, as I've said, um, and the fact that they see access to technology is absolutely essential to continuing to grow their economy, given the problems that they're facing, and they need that growth for political stability. So it goes right to the heart of what the Chinese Communist Party sees as a essential, it's a core issue. So it's a really hard thing, and students definitely are on the front line of that. Yes, please. I believe you showed on your graph that in the case of Japan, the um, relationship was actually being increased between uh, China and, and Japan, as opposed to being decreased. Uh, due to recent developments, particularly some of the approaches that Japan has taken with respect to South Korea. Do you see that actually that trend will actually start to flip and now go the other way, that in fact Japan will start to accelerate a decoupling as opposed to the other direction where it seems to be going? Yeah, we have seen some reduction in, in Japanese dependence on the Chinese market, particularly as I mentioned in labor-intensive goods. They did have a program of reshoring, but it was interesting and quite clever, I think. It, it provided subsidies, not very large. They didn't get a huge buy-up, but they got some, um, where companies could come, in certain industries, had to come back to Japan to get subsidies, but in others simply had to move away from China, uh, recognizing that there are many activities that just could not be done um, efficiently, economically, with ch at Japanese wages. So they have had some success. Um, I think that the economic impetus of being in that neighborhood is definitely contributed to what we saw as a rapprochement that, that took place uh, recently. Uh, the South Koreans are deeply concerned about Chinese economic coercion, as are the Japanese. The Japanese are America's closest ally. Uh, they carried on the torch for the TPP after we withdrew. Um, and de definitely light a candle every night that the U.S. will rejoin. Um, so they really, really want to pave the way for deeper U.S. Engage economic engagement in the region. So I think you will definitely see this Chinese, uh, sorry, Japanese, South Korean uh, relationship developing, both believing that they need to um, diversify. Uh, again, not necessarily uh, moving away from China as much as restoring what they see as a more balanced economic relationship with its partners. Don't forget, they both are parts of the Regional Cooperative Economic Partnership, of which China is a member. It's an ASEAN-led group. Uh, you may say, oh my God, another acronym. The important thing about that is that it allows for very... Um, uh, what are called advantageous rules of origin. Basically what that means is it turns all of these countries into a place where uh, goods can accumulate value through a multinational. So it makes that RCEP setting, of which China is part, very attractive or increasingly attractive. And so they, even as they want to pull away, there are forces which make that difficult. Any questions? Please, um, is there a for mic more? for this woman? Oh, there's someone over here. Right here, on the aisle. There you go. Matt, right here. Oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for your brilliant presentation. Uh, do you think that we are seeing the end of the Belt and Road Initiative, or that Xi Jinping will manage to bring it back to life with a different format? I, I think it's, it's, it's already breathing as we speak. Um, is the Chinese um, have learned some lessons. They didn't set out to create a lot of debts that will never be repaid. Um, and they also, so they are trying to, as we say, increase the quality of their lending. They're working more cooperatively with multilateral banks, like the bank they started, the Asian Infrastructure um, Investment Bank, which itself was young and needed help from the World Bank to create projects. These are large projects that need environmental assessments and uh, working closely with sovereign 
debt and other things. So they are beginning to try to increase the quality. They're moving away, and they have been for quite some time from investment in just natural resources. That's another claim that's made about Chinese investment. Um, and they're moving heavily into helping countries with the green transition. So if they do these things, my guess would be that they're actually making the new Belt and Road, Belt and Road 2, BRI 2, uh, more attractive. So yes, it's very much alive. And something that the West needs to compete with, as we know, it's part of uh, you know Build Back Better World or whatever you want to call it. It's now in the G7, but yeah, these countries are definitely looking to the West to provide ex you know funding as being an alternative funder. Sorry, yes. Yes, hi. Uh, looking at all these different countries that have been doing business with China, I don't see their new friends, Russia and Iran. Mm -hmm. um, is trade happening uh, at a, a substantial level? with their friendship with these uh, new countries? I mean, obviously China needs oil, and that's the number one, I think, imported product. But what are these countries getting in return, if anything? These countries of IPEF are not really trading much with Russia or Iran. China absolutely has increased its exports to Russia as well as its imports from Russia. So that trade relationship has, con has really uh, moved forward quickly. You're right that uh, petroleum is a large part of it. And, um, you know, to some extent, the United States hasn't really interrupted that. Um, India also receives a lot of oil from Russia. And part of that is because we need to keep oil prices at a reasonable level for a whole variety of, of reasons. What we want is n Russia not to be paid much for it. So we want the Q at a low P. And, um, you know, this is something that the European Union tried to craft with its its price cap on Russian oil, not you know not as effective as as some may have wanted, um, but it's not clear that the U.S. wants to cut you know sees that in an entirely negative light. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you very much, Paul Sheard. Um, do you have a sense of how China? is looking at interpreting, thinking about all of the issues that we've been discussing tonight. So from the China perspective, yeah. how would they uh, react to all of this kind of discussion? And, and what might they say that would perhaps cast a different light on the whole issue? Would no. they want to break up, for example? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that question. Um, I will not presume to read into the mind of Xi Jinping. I think that uh, would be a disaster. But, um, you know, they have been quite vocal in saying that they think that um, they are not a threat, that they still see the U.S. as a partner for which a win-win partnership is possible. We say that all the time. We have had, we have hosted four delegations of economists from China since the beginning of the year, which is a lot um, and clearly shows a a uh, strong desire on the parts of the Chinese to begin again after COVID to, to communicate face-to-face. -face. Um, we are headed to Beijing in about 10 days for another track to dialogue with uh, the Chinese uh, on economic issues. Um, and of course, the US government has set up official working groups, of which two, the most important ones, which are work through the US Treasury, have, have begun to meet. So these are good signs. People are talking. Um, I think Chinese economists are quite concerned. Um, unlike what we might have found two or three years ago, where we just exchanged allegations, whatever, complaints, threats, now there's a more desire to try to find some low-hanging fruit where cooperation can be done. It can't be the big things. People keep saying, well, we can still cooperate on climate change. Climate change is a big thing. Um, you know, my own view would be let's reform the Trump tariffs. Politics, of course, keeps us from doing that. But we could send an enormous signal both to the world and to China by saying, no, we need to keep tariffs on these things for these reasons. And the rest of the stuff, let's, let's say it's important for us to maintain our commitments to the World Trade Organization. I think that could begin to start a conversation about the U.S. reengaging. 
Um, and you will hear um, our U.S. Trade Ambassador and others tell us we are very engaged with the WTO, but it just really isn't true. We're, we're not pushing the, the ball forward at all. And the reason is for the one she gave today, I'm pulling out of the digital trade, or like yesterday, which is we want the policy space. We don't want to be constrained. But of course, the U.S. will be a major shaper of whatever rules do get written or however the rules get reformed. So um, our not being there, of course, means that that reform is probably not going to take place. And if it does, that the U.S. won't have a say in how it's shaped. Um, so I'm not sure how they view it. I think they view it as why do you guys see us as such a big threat? We're not a threat to you. Um, at the same time, you know, I have asked some of their best economists why do you care? I mean, the exports, as large as the export bundle is, it's about 3% of China's manufacturing output. And manufacturing is less than 50% of the GDP. So, like, why are you guys all hot and bothered by this? I think it is um, a number of reasons. But one clearly is that they see it as hurting their um, ability to maintain productivity growth, which is, of course, the secret sauce of growth. Uh, the U.S. market is the most sophisticated market in the world. Um, it is the most competitive in the world. And as they say, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere, right? It's not just New York, New York. It's the United States. And so they desperately want to stay in the American market. Um, so at least on economic terms. Of course, the export controls are a whole different thing. And I think I've talked before about how I think that that is definitely effective and biting. I will join the group that says thank you for the presentation. It was really enlightening and thought-provoking. What is your take on should the two wars that are going on today last for some extended period of time, whatever that looks like, how will those impact uh, trade? How, do we, how, how are we going to be feeling that the most other That's than exporting really money? That's a really hard question. Yeah. I will say at least a couple of things. First of all, um, the war that is most we're entering in second we're in the second year of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, it has changed minds in Europe regarding China. Chinese position on the war in Ukraine is of vital interest to the Europeans and has changed, has made them listen to the Americans about the threats and the concerns much more deeply. So I think that that has been a, a major sea change for them, a real wake-up call, such that you even have you know, the Germans who before you know, wanted to continue to sell their exports. They had a large surplus with, with China. So it is, it's had a major impact in that way. Um, other than that, in terms of the U.S.-China relationship, you know, the continuing friendship between China and Russia continues to be a source of geopolitical tension that tension um, puts an enormous amount of uncertainty into the decisions that have to be made in the C-suites. I would not want to be someone who has to make decisions about where we're going to build our next plant, but those are the decisions that have to be made, especially when we have industries that are beginning to um, move very fast uh, through the application of AI, through the uh, heating, heating up of the new energy transition globally. Um, and uh, this uncertainty will reduce, has reduced foreign direct investment into China, which uh, its investment from the U.S. Colla really collapsed uh, af after 2020, but is also collapsing more generally. So it is a threat to China in that sense of getting uh, continued investment, which is, of course, necessary for continued participation in global value chains. And it does open up opportunities for other countries. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lovely, for your presentation and for taking time to answer questions. Thank you. My pleasure.